So let me introduce to you our first speaker for today. Okay, many myths surround common heart concerns, especially in regards to high blood pressure and cholesterol and their available treatments. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Denise Schneer, cardiologist from Heart Matters Medical Center, to share with us on these myths, debunked and demystified. Dr. Dinesh graduated in 1996 from the National University of Ireland, Galway. He worked in Ireland and the United Kingdom before returning to Singapore to complete his cardiology advanced specialty training at the National Heart Center. He moved to Tan Tok Seng Hospital in 2006, where he became the director of the coronary care unit and head of the invasive cardiac catheterization laboratory and interventional services. Currently, Dr. Nair admits and manages patients in Mount Elizabeth, Elizabeth Novena Hospital and Mount Elizabeth Hospital. His subspecialty is in interventional cardiology and percutaneous valve therapies and complex angioplasty and stenting procedures. He has also published numerous scientific, scientific papers. So let us put our hands together to welcome Dr. Dinesh Nair. Okay, um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm actually here among uh, good friends. I was going to say old friends. They're not old, they're young. Um, I, I know the organizers quite well, and uh, I would like to thank you all for inviting me back once again to give a talk here, and to thank all of you for coming down to listen to us speak today. Can you hear me in the back? Is it all good? Yeah. I'm just trying to get this adjusted, the lapel thing. So uh, I'm a cardiologist, and um, one of the things people are always worried about is heart health, um, but it's not just the heart. A cardiologist deals with um, pumps and pipes. So the pump is the heart. And if I could ask you all to indulge me for a second, to just put up your fist like this, if you don't mind, and look at that. Everything starts and stops at something the size of this. This is the size of your heart. It sits in the center of your chest down here. You can put your fist down. Thank you for indulging me. And in here, OK, everything starts and stops. When your heart stops, everything stops. When your heart starts, everything starts. So I'd like to think we're the most important organ, but I, I'm a little biased that way, OK? So, what you have is a pump sitting in here. This pump requires blood to flow to it, and those are the pipes. So what we are, in essence, is I'm a plumber. I deal with pumps and pipes. But, but everything, as I said, starts and stops at this essential pump that sits here in the center of your chest. So if you think about the whole spectrum of diseases, we talk about cardiovascular disease. So a stroke, OK? That also depends on the way your heart functions. So there's pipes heading up towards your neck. There's pipes heading to your heart. And all these things, if there's blockages in them, we can fix them. That's the main thing that we find that is wrong. But there's so many other types of heart diseases as well. I'm going to go through a few of these. We're going to try and simplify some of these things, so bear with us. And that's why I, the, the, the title I always use is How to Catch a Heart Attack Before It Catches You. Okay? And that's why we're here. We try to prevent a problem before it happens. And I'm going to try and see if these slides work. So I work in Mount Elizabeth Hospital. The two Mount Elizabeth hospitals, by the way. One is at Orchard, one is at Novena. And this is a picture of me and actually my dad. Okay? I'm a second generation cardiologist. And this is one of our patients from a re it was not recent, a few years ago, a feature in the newspapers. This young guy, he's in his 30s. Okay? He had a heart attack at a very early age. He did not know that he had blocks in his heart arteries, and he felt that he was invincible at the end of the day. He was a little bit overweight, like everyone is these days. And what happened was we had to fix several blockages in his heart. And he says a heart attack saved his life because after this, he lost 15 kilograms and went back and became healthy. Now, we all think that we're relatively slim, healthy, fit. Um, it, all, it is all relative because what we've done with modern lifestyle is that we've changed everything. Our ancestors used to run around for 10 hours a day, exercising, um, not intentionally sometimes, because they had to go out and find food and things like that. But we changed everything the last 2,000 years. So what we think is a normal, healthy human being is not necessarily so. And that is why we need to make certain changes in our lives. And that is why we need to be concerned, because 
A sudden cardiac event, such as sudden cardiac death, can happen to anyone, anywhere, anytime. And we have data from Singapore where it says one to two Singaporeans under the age of 60 die from a heart attack or cardiac arrest every day. That means the ambulances bring these people into hospitals and they don't make it. Or the ambulances turn up at the home and they don't make it. And that is why we need to do certain things to prevent this. So a sudden cardiac death is something that occurs without warning. Okay? And that's the key element, without warning. Because most of the time, when you get your first event, heart event, stroke, whatever you want to you call it, it often occurs without warning. And that is why you need to do checkups, preempt this before something happens. And it's frequently in people who feel that they're healthy, healthy individuals with no history of a heart problem. Okay? Do you, a lot of people here, I gather lots of people here from a Singaporean, yes? So do you all remember Dola Kassim? You do, right? Okay? I think in this generation, definitely, you will remember Dola Kassim. Okay? He was considered to be Singapore's best footballer many years ago, super fit. He was, doing, he was playing in a veteran game and collapsed. Do you remember this several years ago? I, yeah, I had to do a press conference for this. I always bring this one up because he had undetected health problems. He never went for a checkup. He thought that he exercised very well and he was fit and healthy. His heart stopped for 15 minutes. Ever since this event, actually a lot of things have changed in Singapore. We have, um, everyone heard about cardio, of CPR, where you do cardiac resuscitation, where you shock the patient. In all the sports centers, ever since then, we've had one of these at every single sports center in Singapore. So he didn't make a change. Dola didn't have blood supply to his brain for about 15 to 18 minutes, and he lay in a coma for a long time. Okay? But we can prevent these things by checking early. Now, it isn't only the older players. Dola was in his 50s. We have young players in their 20s and in their teens collapsing as well. Not all heart problems are due to blockages in the heart arteries. Some people have abnormal heart rhythms. Some people have abnormal heart muscle valves that are abnormal. And that is why in the last 10, 15 years as well, we've instituted special changes in the way we do checks for young people going into the army. Any of you who've got kids going into the army now will notice compared to perhaps your time when you went in, that they do a lot more checks before you go in. If there are any abnormalities, you're referred on to the National Heart Center to do scans. So these are things that we've instituted over time. But having said that, medical heart problems for younger people are quite rare. Most people start developing problems in their hearts, probably in their 40s, with cholesterol buildup like this. This, let me see if this works well. Yeah, this is how cholesterol can build up in the heart arteries. These are your arteries sitting on top of the heart, giving blood supply to the heart muscle. The blood supply carries oxygen, okay? So if you've got a block somewhere here, what you'd have is lack of oxygen to the heart muscle because of lack of blood supply. And what you get is like a cramp. So let's say if you were to try and do lift weights several times and you keep doing it, you get an oxygen lack to the heart muscle. The same way to the, to the arm muscle, the same way it can happen with the heart muscle as well, and you get a little bit of a cramp. So often the first symptom of a heart problem is chest discomfort or chest pain. But everyone doesn't get that. Sometimes it is just breathlessness as you're walking up. You find that, you know, in the past you could climb up four stories. Now when you climb up two stories, you get a little bit breathless. This could be an early warning sign. But as I said, very often people don't get the warning signs. So the same way you get blocks here, if you had a block like this, cholesterol building up in the vessels, you could have a similar block in the neck arteries. A block in the neck arteries going up towards the head can cause a stroke. This is why we call it cardiovascular disease. Cardio meaning heart, vascular is vessels. The vessels to the heart, vessels to the neck. So as I said, my life is quite simple. Whenever anyone's got a block in an artery somewhere, I just have to open it up. Whenever anyone has a hole, in the heart muscle or anywhere else that shouldn't be there, we just close it up. So it is plumbing once again, okay? <laughs> so if we look at this list here, these are not necessarily causes. What these are are risk factors. I'm trying to find a way. Maybe I put this here. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, this is a lot better, okay. So these are risk factors for heart disease. They're not necessarily causes, okay? 
Smoking is number one. Diabetes, being overweight. I mentioned before that unless you're carrying a six pack on you right now, you're overweight. We're all overweight or relatively overweight. Our ancestors did not carry any fat on them because they're walking around outside, they have to hunt for their food. We've got an abundance of food and we're all carrying a little bit of a punch. Everyone is to some degree, okay? Um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Now, cholesterol levels are relative. If you look at the normal guidelines for what high cholesterol is, you will find that 50% of people are within the limit. Okay, that means their cholesterol is not particularly high. Now, in reality, our cholesterol should be about half of what we put in the guidelines. Is anyone, I'm sure people here have done blood tests before, where you've gone into a polyclinic or to a doctor's office and done a cholesterol check. And you see that your levels are within the normal limits. That is not really the true norm. Because what we found is that for people who live in um, a different kind of environment, let's say they live in the jungle, okay, the hunter-gatherers, those who have not seen modern lifestyle, their cholesterol is about half to one-third of what we consider the upper limit of normal. Animals that run around in the wild, their cholesterol is lower as well. So I don't know if you know, I'm going to go through this later on. 130 is what we put down in our Singapore guidelines. If you're less than 130, you're considered to be normal for the bad cholesterol called LDL. Okay, so there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. I'll come to this in a short while again. But most mammals run below 50. The other thing we have is sedentary lifestyle and genetics. Genetics play a big part. Racial predisposition. It, is, it has been found in Singapore, in the Singapore uh, context, that Indians have a three times higher risk of heart attack compared to the Chinese in Singapore. And that is because of several thousand years of, well, overly rich food, among other things. A lot of fat, a lot of ghee, a lot of oil in the food. And that has been changed because people have become more and more aware of this. But what you have is over several generations, you end up having a genetic predisposition. So there are different races that have a significant predisposition for certain types of diseases. And of course, stress. Stress is there in life for everybody. Stress does not increase your cholesterol, but what it does is, if you remember the earlier picture that I showed you, if you have your pipes and you've got cholesterol sitting in there, what stress does is it allows that plaque or cholesterol buildup to rupture. So it ruptures like a volcano, spewing forth all its stuff, forming a clot. So stress increases the risk of a heart attack for everybody, but it does not increase your cholesterol, it does not increase other things, but it causes changes in the artery wall that supplies blood to the heart. And another very unrecognized problem called obstructive sleep apnea. How many people here have heard about sleep apnea? Okay, so people are becoming more and more aware of this. Sleep apnea is where there is lack of air getting in towards your lung because there's an obstruction in the airway. Many people, when they lie on their back, they snore. You snore because you're having a problem or you're struggling to get air in and struggling to get air out. Okay? When you do that, you end up having a strain on the heart muscle. When there's increased strain on the heart muscle, there's stress. There's different kinds of stress. There's emotional, um, there is psychological, and there's physical stress. This is physical stress on the heart when you're trying to sleep at night. That also increases your risk of getting a heart attack. Okay? So, we've talked about all these problems. What can we do about it? First of all, we have to make the lifestyle changes. Everybody needs to be active, minimum 30 minutes, almost every day, of at least walking, exercising, doing something physically active. We all tend not to do that, because modern lifestyle has allowed us to cheat a little bit, okay? We said we don't need to walk to the shop, we can drive to the shop. We don't need to walk up the stairs, we can take a lift, okay? So we need to change our lifestyle, we need to cut down on sugar and fat. These are all new things that have been introduced into the diet over the last few hundred years for most of us. Okay? And if you have a medical problem, medication is recommended, and if it has been recommended by a doctor, it is a very good idea to take it. Many people come to me and tell me, no, doc, I don't want to take medicine. No, I want to try without medication. If you've already got a block, if you've already got a block in your heart arteries or a heart problem, you're going to need to take medication. Okay? And medication is not bad for you because 
Doctors like us tend to give you medication if you actually need it. And then, if there are blocks, um, this is what I do, as I said, plumbing, we can open up those blocks for you. Quite simply, in the old days, the only solution was bypass surgery if you had a block in your heart arteries. Now we've got so much new technology that we're going to go through with you. And the final thing I put down, the reason I put up Dola Kasim's um, uh, picture earlier on was that all of us can actually learn how to do something called CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, where you resuscitate. If you learn how to do this, you could save someone's life, someone dear to you. There are courses being held in so many different places, um, the community centers, uh, and you can call most of the hospitals. They actually, co they actually conduct courses like this as well. Okay, so what are the lifestyle changes that we need? Eating right, watching your weight, being active like we mentioned, lowering stress levels, and of course, stop smoking. I never say stop drinking alcohol entirely, but you can drink a little bit if you need to. But drinking in excess is bad for you. Okay, exercise increases the good cholesterol, reduces the bad cholesterol. It trains your heart to withstand the stresses and strains of daily living. And it helps control things such as diabetes and hypertension. I mentioned again, exercise for at least 30 minutes daily, okay? And do something you enjoy, okay? Swimming, walking, walking the dog. For most people, most of our patients, they end up buying things like a treadmill machine and putting it in front of the uh, television. So while you're watching television, you can exercise for 30 minutes. Do two things at the same time, okay? And try to eat the healthy food here as opposed to the unhealthy food. All of us know this. Okay, too much sugar, too much fat is bad for you. Okay, all you have to do is cut it down. And I have this little, this little um, um, trick that, that we, we tell people, okay? Make sure that you do not eat more, remember I asked you to hold your fist up, not eat more than the size of your fist, okay? In terms of rice or bread um, or meat. And eat at least the size of your fist in vegetables and fruits. Okay, so that fist size thing is very important and exercise regularly. Relax, visit the doctor when you need to, um, and keep your weight down. Can you still hear me in the back? Is it clear? Yeah? Okay. Because this thing is, uh, I'm trying to get it near me. Okay? So, we mentioned risk factors. The biggest risk factors that are modifiable these days are high blood pressure. People don't usually get symptoms of high blood pressure. It is something that is measured in a doctor's office and cholesterol. If your cholesterol is high and we treat it, we can prevent blockages from occurring. So blood pressure is the force created as your heart pumps blood and moves through your blood vessels. So people usually have two numbers. There's a top number and a bottom number, okay? Both these numbers, if they're above a certain level and they're abnormal, on several occasions, not just one occasion, your blood pressure can go up and down during the course of the day, then that needs to be treated. A normal blood pressure is something in this range, 110 to 130 over 60 to 80. And by definition, high blood pressure is when you have blood pressure of 140 over 90. So the first value that you have is the, <coughs> excuse me, is the systolic blood pressure. The second value is the diastolic blood pressure. So if either one of these is above the limit, then you know that you've got high blood pressure if you've measured it on several occasions in a doctor's office and found to be high. The higher the blood pressure, the higher the chance of getting a stroke or a heart attack or so many other things as well, okay? But we must remember that your blood pressure measurements vary during the course of the day. So what, we, what many people don't realize is when they exercise, your blood pressure can go up 20, 30, 40 millimeters mercury. That is the measurement here. When we do treadmill stress tests, people's blood pressure go up to about 200 for the top reading, and that is considered acceptable. That's why the blood pressure reading that you take should be one when you're rested for at least 15 minutes. For someone to have high blood pressure on an exercise like a treadmill stress test, it needs to be above 220 for the top reading, okay? So a normal resting blood pressure above this on several occasions is high blood pressure, and then you need to treat it. Okay, we'll, we'll slip past this, okay? I also mentioned cholesterol. These are the two biggest modifiable risk factors that we have. High blood pressure, cholesterol. 
We know that there is good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Okay, LDL is bad cholesterol, triglycerides, bad cholesterol, HDL, good cholesterol. Okay, you've heard this over and over again in the newspapers, when you go and see a doctor, and generally we try and keep whatever is bad as low as possible, and whatever is good as high as possible. And that's why we need to balance this. Okay, we get bad cholesterol um, forming clots and forming blockages in the heart arteries. Okay, I showed you that in the previous picture as well. And that's why all these foods that, have, that are high in sugar, high in fat, they all get converted into bad stuff in the body. So you just cut down the sugar, cut down the fat, and normally everything sorts itself out. Okay, I'd mentioned a few numbers earlier on. I thought I'd mention it earlier so you have an idea in your head. If you go and do a blood test in your doctor's office, they always tell you your total cholesterol should be less than 200 or 5.2 on another scale. You might remember some of these from reports that you see. I would gather most people here, I'd say more than 50% of people here, have had their cholesterol checked at some point. Yeah, I see a lot of people nodding their heads. Okay? Now, under Singapore guidelines, it says that you're relatively okay if your LDL is less than 130 on this particular scale or less than 3.4 on this scale. Now, <coughs> I told you that that is not entirely true. This is the normal value for an unhealthy human population. If, if you have uh, your cholesterol checked when you're a kid, children tend to have LDLs less than 50. Animals tend to have LDLs less than 50. And this is actually the true norm. Okay? Can anyone guess? Okay? Has, has anyone ever thought about this? What do you think the normal value of LDL or bad cholesterol is for an orangutan? Orangutan, like Ameng in the, in, in the zoo. They look, they look very unhealthy, right? They look like they're slouching about, doing absolutely nothing all the time. But orangutans in the wild have LDLs less than 25 or 30. Right? They are closest relative genetically, supposedly, anyway. Okay? So that is the true norm. Okay? So what we need to do is modify these risk factors. Okay? I'm going to skip past this and basically go into this where we have... What we, this is a normal, healthy plate. More vegetables, less starch and protein. A little bit of milk, a little bit of fruit. This is what we should be eating. Okay? I'm going to skip past this wall. So... All this is what you need to do to prevent a problem, okay? But how do you detect one? You go and have proper cardiac screening. Certain tests, such as an ECG, or an echo, or a treadmill stress test, these are things that all of you have heard about at some point, okay? An ECG is a basic test to look at your heart rhythm with a bunch of electrodes put on your chest, okay, to monitor it. A treadmill is an ECG when you're walking and exercising, and then we can assess if there are changes. These changes could indicate a block. And that's why we do screening tests such as this. Okay, I'll skip past this. Okay, and what we have now, and l we're lucky enough to be living in a modern age where we have good technology, we have CT scans and lots of other scanning machines that can detect a blockage and therefore allow us to fix it before a problem arises. This is a 50-year-old guy. Okay, he looks very fit. You can see muscles and everything else marathon runner, he went for a routine screening test and found a big block in his heart arteries. He's actually a male nurse and they were just trying out a new machine. And this came out in Time magazine about 10 years ago. Okay? We can do tests such as an ultrasound scan of your heart, ultrasound scan of your neck arteries to look for blocks. If we find blocks, we can start the appropriate treatment, medical therapy, cholesterol drugs, etc. This is an echo which looks at the pump function of the heart. We can tell if the pump function is strong, if you need medications to treat that as well. These are the kinds of things that we do in our clinic. This is a good pump function where you can see the squeeze of the heart. It's quite good, and this one doesn't squeeze so well. Can you see the difference? Yeah. <coughs> hmm. Okay, and I'll skip past some of these. And we can look to see if there are leakages um, in the valves. We can see if any of the valves are functioning badly. If you look here, you can see another, this, this is a scan of the neck arteries, carotid arteries, normal, and one here with a block, 
Okay, you can see that the flow has been compromised. So if you get something like this, we can fix it. We can stent it, we can do surgery, we can open it up. And if it's not too big, we can start medical therapy. Okay, this is a CT scan showing blockages. This is a normal artery, a CT scan where we inject dye or contrast. And here, small blocks. And then here, a bigger block. You can see it's narrowed from here to here. So this is the technology that we have these days. And another one here, an artery in the heart with a block. Okay? So, if you've got blockages, it's easy enough to fix them. But if you've got rhythm abnormalities, how do you detect them? We have certain devices we can use these days where you put a monitor over the chest and look to see if the heart rhythm has become abnormal. This is when people get things such as palpitations. You've all heard about people getting palpitations. Your heart rate beating away, your heart racing away. These are devices we can use to do this. We have devices that can monitor your blood pressure over 24 hours and treat it appropriately because some people have something called white coat hypertension where when they see a doctor, every time they see a doctor, the blood pressure goes up. But when they're home, the pressure is normal. Okay? That's common enough. Okay? The first time everyone comes to meet me, the pressure goes up a little bit. We also have other types of technology where we can scan and look to see if the heart muscle has got compromise of blood flow to it. These are all very interesting pictures. You can see this is the heart, and this is actually a radioisotope that has been injected into the, the blood vessels, and it sits in the heart. We can see which part of the heart muscle doesn't have sufficient blood flow. Okay, and if, for some reason, you have blockages, this is us uh, during a course that we conduct in Singapore every January, we can actually fix blockages. A coronary angiogram is where we pass a catheter, inject dye, and we look for blocks in the heart arteries. This is a catheter injecting dye into this arteries here, and then trying to fix. This is a block in the heart arteries. So we can put a stent, a balloon. You've all heard about ballooning and stenting, right? Bypass surgery was the only solution. But nowadays, luckily enough, okay, we have less invasive methods where we pass a catheter up the arm, inject dye, and fix the block with a balloon or a stent. Okay, from the leg of the arm, once again, this is how ballooning and stenting is done. We pass the catheter up the leg or the arm. I do 99% of mine. 99% of our procedures are all done from the arm. The patient gets up and walks the same day with no issues. If there's a block, we can put a balloon inside and we can fix it. Okay, and from the arm. The old root from the leg and this one from the arm. Okay, and that's all you have at the end of it, small little dot. So technology has moved on quite a bit these days. There's just more pictures of the same. Blockage, balloon, and that's how, that's how it looks like when we do an angiogram. An angiogram is where you pass a catheter in, inject dye, and balloon and stent it. Okay? An angioplasty is where we fix it. Like that, and leave a stent behind. Okay? So I'm going to flip past. This is a patient of ours with a 100% block, balloon, and once you put a stent in, the artery has got restoration of flow. Okay, I'll just flip past all this, okay, and, and this is just another picture of the same. And nowadays what we have are stents that can dissolve and go away. This is a polymer stent. Everyone's heard of metal stents being put in. In the last five years we've been putting in stents that can dissolve and go away. In certain patients for certain types of blockages, the stents that we put in can actually dissolve and go away and the artery heals as per normal. Okay, and this is our patient, the first patient that we did. This is a CT scan with a stent inside. And this one is the absorbable stent with just markers sitting in there. And these are the arteries. Okay, so I'll flip past this again. And now, if for some reason you've got multiple blocks everywhere and there's no possibility of, of ballooning and stenting it, then we think about things such as bypass surgery, open heart surgery. But we're living in an age where we hardly ever have to do this anymore. Okay? Because this is the quicker way of sorting things out for most people. Okay? So, to wrap things up, um, once again, um, heart disease, okay? If you're this guy, and if he had gone and done checks early on, he could have prevented his heart attack. And that's what we're trying to tell everyone. 
okay? Make sure you see your doctor, make sure you get your checks done. And if you have blocks and if you have problems, it is not the end of the world, okay? This guy is almost eight years old, I believe, and he's completed seven half marathons after having ballooning and stenting. I'm not saying you should go and run a marathon after you've had balloons and stents, okay? But I'm telling you that people can go back to a normal life, all right? And treat the causes and make sure that if you've got any of these risk factors, we sort things out as early as possible, okay? Mm -hmm. So you remember all this, early checks, medication, fix things if you need to, learn CPR, it's always a good thing to do. And if you want to listen to any more talks that we've done, um, if you just Google under uh, YouTube, there are a few other talks that, I, that I've done and on other heart issues if you want to have a listen at some point. Yeah, thank you. Do we do any Q&A or? So would anyone like to ask any questions? Uh, for those who want to ask questions, we have a two robing beautiful ladies here with mics. Please raise your hands if you have some questions for Dr. Dinesh. Actually, I have a write-in question while waiting for the others to think uh, of the questions. A write-in question. Yes, wait, they gave it to me earlier. So, Okay. Uh, the question is, if I sweat more profusely than others, does it mean my heart is also pumping too hard and is a sign of a heart problem? Okay, so everything is relative, right? So sweat more than other people. Are you sweating more now compared to before? Um, that's the first thing that you need to ask. There's some people who have actually got abnormal sweat glands, and from early days, they just sweat and sweat and sweat a lot. That doesn't mean the heart is working more, okay? But let's say you didn't use to sweat one year ago, and now whenever you do a little bit of activity, you start sweating a lot as a result. That means your body is trying to cope with the stress of what you're doing. It may mean that your heart is having a problem, but what it should tell you is that you need to go and get yourself checked up, okay, more than anything else. But there's so many causes of sweating more, okay? If you lived in England and you suddenly moved to Singapore and every day you're sweating, <laughs> right, there's an obvious reason for that as well because you're, you're living in a very hot country. So uh, these are things that we have to keep in mind as well, yes. Okay. We have another question, Doctor. Doctor Naya, can you explain more about the electrical activity of the heart? Uh, how does it come about? Okay. Um, Thank you. I guess you're, you're asking me this because um, you know of someone who's got abnormal heart rhythm or the heart beating abnormally. So you've got two top chambers in the heart and two bottom chambers. The electrical activity of the heart is determined by a pacemaker cell. You've all heard of pacemakers, okay? That's us artificially creating a box to pace the heart. There's a pacemaker cell in the upper chamber of the heart that determines the rate. It transmits electrical activity down towards the bottom chambers of the heart, and they pump according to the impulse given from the top. So if for some reason you have an abnormality in the track from the top to the bottom, then you start getting abnormal heart rhythms. There are people where this pathway or this passageway of electrical activity from the top to the bottom where that's been cut, then you have something called a heart, complete heart block. Not a blockage in the artery, but a block in the electrical pathway going down. When this happens, people tend to have to put in something called a pacemaker to give a new rhythm to the heart, okay? But if for some reason the activity from the top to the bottom goes down an abnormal pathway, then the heart rate can go very, very fast. If that happens, then what you need to do is rectify that problem. Most of the time, people take medication to prevent an abnormality from the top to the bottom of the heart, where you've got an electrical power. It's, it's, like, it's like the um, uh, electrical wires in your home, top to bottom. If something goes wrong with the wiring, that wiring needs to be fixed. Okay? I think the reason you're asking me this is because someone you know, at least, has got abnormal, an abnormal beat. How does the electrical activity come about? It happens in the body. Wow, okay. <laughs> I could be sitting here for about half an hour trying to explain that one. Um, <clears throat> okay, okay, 
So the same way, there is a cell. Okay, electricity is everywhere. Okay, there's electrical activity everywhere. Our body. Okay, if you put an ECG on uh, the chest, what it does is it monitors that electrical activity. So there's an innate electrical activity in everything. Okay, so the heart has its own electrical pacemaker cell. It ex it, it gives out this electricity and it runs down like a wiring. So we're actually built that way. Why do we have electricity in the heart? God only knows, okay? But this electrical activity is what determines your life because that impulse sends stuff down the wire, okay, down the wire from the top to the bottom and stimulates the heart to beat. It's the same thing. Even in your muscles, you've actually got electrical activity going down your muscle and causing the muscle to contract. This innate electrical activity is what is uh, called life, I guess. Yeah. Can we have one more question? Researchers have found out that uh, high cholesterol is not related to heart attacks. Okay, this is a very good question. Okay, thank you for asking this. It's not true. It's in the internet but it's not in any scientific journal, and it's on the WhatsApp messages that everybody receives, probably about once a month, and the email messages that everyone receives. High cholesterol is related to blocks. And recently, you would have found in the newspapers, recently in the Straits Times and on the BBC, um, there's been new publications stating that cholesterol-lowering drugs do much more good than harm, and that all the stuff you hear on the internet is hype. The people that they quote as experts on this, none of us have ever even heard about them. <laughs> okay, and that's the problem with internet medicine. You know? Uh. Potential side effects, every drug has. Panadol, when you take it, you can have a rash. <laughs> red yeast rice, okay, do you, know, do you know what red yeast rice is? It's the first statin that we ever, we ever discovered. Red yeast rice has got a small amount of the old statin called lower statin that you get in the polyclinics, but a smaller dose in the natural form. It reduces your cholesterol only 10, 20%. So red yeast rice can drop it. But if your LDL or bad cholesterol is 150 and you want to bring it down to half, red yeast rice won't do it. Or you'd have to take 50 tablets of red yeast rice and then the side effect profile is the same because it's the same drug just that it's available over the counter. Like most over the counter medications, it's just a lower dose of what you have as a prescription medicine. Statins potentially cause muscle ache, can cause liver problems, but I've treated thousands of patients. I've probably seen one patient with a major side effect from a statin. But we saved thousands of lives by putting patients on the statin. I have one last yeah. question. Uh, doctor, regarding the issue about the uh, excessive sweating, so we kind of doctor do we go to look for? Is it heart doctor or one doing glands? <laughs> okay, um, it, it depends, it depends. Um, I have to admit a lot of people come and see me for this, okay? Um, and we can sort it out for them as well. Um, uh, I'm a cardiologist in private practice, so some people may feel, oh, you know, it might be a little bit expensive to go and see a cardiologist for this to start with. But if you were to want to go into the government sector to look for a doctor, you would not be able to get to see a cardiologist straight away. Then you'd have to go to your GP or to your polyclinic doctor first, okay? And then they'd need to assess you to see what the cause of sweating is before they refer you on. But having said that, I see a lot of people in my clinic for this. We assess them. And I have to admit, 70 to 80 percent of the time, it turns out not to be a heart problem, but at least I can reassure them that it's not a heart problem after we've done whatever checks we need to do. Okay. Depending on the cause of the sweating, but most of the time, a general practitioner or a cardiologist can sort it out for you. Either one. Okay? Doctor, can we have one more question? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Am I overrunning my time? It's okay. Okay, and I think we're good, right? 210, yes. I get a lot of tough questions here, actually. Are <laughs> <laughs> listening? Yeah. Yes, how can I help you, ma'am? Um, 
Okay, so everything depends on, on how much you want to check, first of all. Some people don't want to find out too much, okay? <laughs> Some people would like to know and preempt the problem. I would suggest that you find out and fix a problem before it occurs. We do do carotid ultrasounds um, as a routine uh, screening test in our clinics. Um, if you think your risk of stroke and heart attack is higher, a carotid ultrasound actually tells you a lot of information. It will become routine when um, there is the ability to have a test like that paid for um, by the system that we live in. And that is going to be impossible. So it will never become a routine test because it's a test that you have to pay for to do. Um, screening tests for the entire population, it is impossible for any, any government, any society to do. But I can tell you that it's already becoming a routine screening test because it's very simple. Ultrasound scan of the neck artery. If you've got cholesterol plaque buildup, you've got buildup here, you're likely to have buildup in your heart arteries too. And that tells you you need to make the changes. So is it a root, will it become a routine screening test? Probably never. Should it be a routine screening test? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Dinesh. Okay. Uh, let's give Dr. Dinesh a round of applause. That was a very insightful sharing. Thank you for being such Thank a great you. audience. Dr. On behalf of uh, Prime Magazine and Ocean Health, we would like to okay. give you this simple token. Great. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you.